Hey guys, welcome back to another Q&A. It is September 16th, 2018. Uh, open Q&A this week, Facebook and Instagram, and not as many questions this week. I cut it off a little bit quicker because for one, I had leftover questions from the previous, and secondly, a couple of these questions were kind of long, so I didn't know how much time it would take. So not really sure how long this one will take, but I think it's probably gonna be about normal. Um, let's go ahead and jump into it here on Facebook. So first one, optimal time off cycle, considering bloods and feedback are all back to normal ranges. So for example, 12 to 16 week blasts, would time off be safe uh, if it's equal to time on? Okay, <clears throat> first off, I mean, <clears throat> there is individuality to this. I think it's important to understand how certain things affect you individually. And if you don't know, you know, you might want to have lab work done midway through the run, get an idea of this. If you're noticing that your blood work's really skewed four weeks in and you're running, you know, whatever for 16 weeks, then, well, I mean, hey, that's that's 12 weeks that your lab work looks pretty bad. And then you're only gonna take, you know, wax amount of time off. So uh, good rule of thumb is it should look good more than it looks bad. So find out where that, where that lies for you. And obviously, like I said, it's gonna be individual. It's gonna depend on how much, for how long. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, the idea that you get your labs done uh, four weeks or six weeks afterwards and they look good, well, that doesn't necessarily mean you're done or you're ready uh, to, to repeat. Um, it just means that they've probably been good for a week. Uh, so, you know, you're gonna to wanna to seem good for months. And <clears throat> also risk versus reward. You know, what are your goals? What are uh, what are you looking to do? I mean, is it, for some people, this might mean that they get two two blasts in a year span, give or take. I mean, that seems to be pretty average that they can mitigate risk that way. Um, but again, you need to learn like where, how do you personally recover and how are you personally affected? <clears throat> Next one, opinion on RU58841 as a potential treatment for DHT related acne. So, okay. I, I'm actually somewhat familiar with this. I'm pretty sure there's some kind of chemical name or drug name for it. I could be wrong. I think the RU5881 or 58841 would be maybe how you would see it on a like a research chemical site or something. Um, to my knowledge, it is not a drug that's approved uh, by the FDA. Like it can't be, you know, you're not gonna be able to go in and get a prescription for it. So there's a reason for that. I mean, I, I'm trying to think back. I, I believe it had went through some trials, but it didn't, There, I mean, there was obviously some reason that it didn't get approved for use. And I could be wrong. Maybe it is approved for use somewhere, just not here in the US. Um, but I do know that I've seen it, I've seen it advertised as like a research chemical, I think. Um, but that's neither here nor there. The question is, is it, you know, potential treatment? And the answer would be yes. I mean, it's, <clears throat> some would argue it's probably better than something like finasteride. It's, and the main thing is it's just not as systemic. Um, could be used topically uh, to block or to, uh, I mean, really just block the receptor at the site that you want to use it at. So if you wanna put it on, rub it on the, the acne itself, it could help in that way, or if probably uses like a hair treatment or you know like shampoo or something. Um, but it, yeah, again, it's just not acting systemically. Um, from what I've under, what, what I understand, it fits, it's basically like, it's gonna to attach to the DHT receptor, but it's not going to have downstream effects because it doesn't activate the receptor, if that makes sense. So that is about all I know about it. I don't know a ton about it beyond that point, um, just because again, it's not something that you see a ton of. Um, I know that little bit of research on it, I know how it works just in a pretty general regard. I've not seen anyone that used it. Um, I know that I've, I've heard about people using it. I don't know anyone personally, I should say. Um, but you know, people said they have pretty good effects for it. This is anything like that. I don't, 
like I'll go into something so far, but when I start running into potential issues and lack of data on something that's completely new like that, or I don't know how new it is, but just lack of data and lack of it not being approved for any kind of treatment, um, then sometimes I stop and lose interest just because I just don't know that I'm super comfortable uh, giving suggestions beyond that point just because it's we don't have enough long-term data. So um, next one. Would love to hear your story with starting your career as a trainer. Did you start as a part-time job? Uh, what did you do to get your first clients? What are also some ways to acquire more clients while being a self-employed coach or trainer? Okay, well, things. first off, things have changed a lot. Just because when I started, we didn't have social media, really. I mean, we did. Um, but not to the extent that we do now. And it wasn't really like a thing to be a coach. It wasn't really that many. I mean, there was some, but not a lot. Um, not like there is now, I mean, not even anywhere close. Um, I started as a personal trainer in a gym, like a lot of people did. And I thought that it would, you know, and I thought that it would be cool to help people nutritionally on the side. And that's kind of what I did. I think I'm actually, this December will be 10 years since I had my very first paid, paid client. So that's pretty cool. Um, I don't remember what I did to get the client. I vaguely remember it though. Um, didn't think much of it at the time. Thought it was cool to make 50 bucks or whatever. But, uh, you know, it's, like I said, it's just changed so much. It, it did start as a part-time job for me. It's something that I thought I wanted to do, but I didn't realistically think that it could be made into a career. I didn't think that it was a potential, um, had potential to be a full-time career and really make a living at it. I mean, there are people, plenty of people that do now, but it, there wasn't that many that did then, you know, 10, 10 years ago or whatever, or some people started you know, well before that. But uh, yeah, so it's part-time. And then I worked something else part-time whether it was like I worked at my dad's business, uh, worked at just various, like worked at a GNC, like a lot of people did, worked at the gym, was a trainer, like a lot of people too. I was a trainer at a gym and then a trainer and then did my online work. Uh, actually, I mean, at one point I was school full-time, training close to full-time, had online clients, all, you know, everything all at the same time. So. You know, it's, it, it just evolved and I eventually took the plunge into uh, doing this exclusively. It was definitely, definitely had a lot of ups and downs along the way. A lot of times where I really questioned that I was going to be able to do it. Um, you know, and I think part of that's just I hold myself to a high standard. I really put a lot of pressure on myself. Uh, you know, I, I knew I had the tools. I just didn't know, like, am I doing a good enough job? Am I going to be able to be competitive with these, with everyone else in the industry and, and so on and so forth. And, uh, yeah, now I am where I am now and definitely not content. Lots more growth to be had for sure. Uh, and that's a super, that's like the super duper condensed version of 10 years of tons of ups and downs and, and questions and scary stuff and, emotions and man, all kinds of stuff. I could talk about it for hours, everything that's gone on, but, uh, acquiring clients, like I'm, I mean, most of the people that watch this and follow me know that I'm not really gimmicky. Like I'm pretty much everything I do is a hundred percent organic. I've just put out endless amounts of information for years on end, nonstop, pretty much every single day. And that's how I acquire clients. That's how I originally acquire clients. I mean, now obviously like I have a lot of tons of referrals and, and just word of mouth and, and, uh, stuff like that. And I'm more visible, you know, cause I don't, you know, I have people that follow my videos and listen to the podcasts and, uh, follow me on Instagram and Facebook and all that, you know, so I mean, it's a, the reach is a lot further, but at the same time, I mean, it's still the same stuff, you know, I'm still putting out, put out information pretty much daily, um, 
I mean, really daily for the most part, do multiple podcasts a week, at least two, and then guest appearances and answer questions where I can for people and uh, do these Q and A's every single week and give out free information as much as I can with still running a business, obviously, but um, you have to do that stuff. You have to, you have to be able to help people and you have to be able to, I think too, now with, with the way the industry is so saturated, you have to be able to offer something to people that maybe not other people that other people can't offer, or you have to be at least offering something that's as good or better than most of the people. You don't have to be the best. It's not like, it's not like one person's the best. There's not the best coach. I mean, I think certain coaches have different strengths than others, but you have to be well-rounded. You have to be able to offer something, a high level of service. You have to be able to offer something that people want, something that people are going to seek you over somebody else. And, and it's like some people carve out a niche too. Some people just work with contest prep people or just work with pros or just work with uh, females or whatever. Um, and that's okay. You know, they make, they do good at that. I don't really have that. I mean, I've, I'm really scattered all over the board, which I like because I think it makes me better because I've, I've learned a lot about a lot of different things and I'm okay with that. So, uh, but again, uh, just to recap, I guess, put out a lot of free information, still do help people as much as possible uh, genuinely care about people and your work and you'll have not only higher client retention, but you'll have more referrals. If those clients say maybe have to leave for financial reasons or something, they're going to be more apt to refer, refer people. I get referrals from people that I work with like five, six, seven, eight years ago. It's like, Oh wow. You know, they, they refer people to me. Don't even talk to them, but that's a sign that, you know, I'm doing the right things and people are, are happy with the service and that they get the results and, and, uh, yeah, it's, if, if, if you are willing to put in the work and do it organically, that's, what's really going to last. It's not gimmicky. It's not just like a get rich quick thing. It's not a, it's not a get as many clients as you can as quick as possible thing and just, and make money. It's, it's quality. It's a quality thing. And quality means also that yours, that, you know, you're going to make a little bit better money in the long run just because you can, you'll have a, a premium service. So, um, that is it for Facebook. Let me jump over to the Instagram thread. I think I have it pulled up. Uh oh, there it is. Okay. A few more questions here. Maybe I just exited it. That's fantastic. Let's find it again. There it is. All right. First one is actually a few questions in one. So I'll try to get them all here. Try to brief over all of them. What's better, magnesium aspartate versus uh, glycinate? Okay. So on that one, there are like a bajillion different forms of magnesium. They do have slightly different, uh, slightly different tendencies depending on them. Some of them, some of them will actually help with bowels. Like they'll give you, you know, like magnesium, uh, like the magnesium that you're going to find in milk and magnesia. Well, that's going to make you shit yourself. That's the point. That's what it's for. It's a, you know, it's basically like going to give you a laxative effect. Uh, the magnesium that you're going to have, like a magnesium glycinate, very high bioavailability. Um, is a really good form of magnesium for pretty much all functions. It does not upset the stomach. However, uh, aspartate's a little bit, I consider it probably a little bit lower quality form. It's going to be a lot cheaper as well. Uh, could it still give you your desired, uh, serum magnesium levels? Yeah, it could. Might give you some side effects in terms of stomach upset. You might need a lot more. Um, there are other, they're chelated, uh, forms there's something like tortate, I think I'm saying that right, that uh, you know supposedly crosses the blood-brain barrier a lot better than any other form. Um, so, I mean, there are different forms for different purposes, but as an all-around, if you want an all-around form of magnesium, I like glycinate or biglycinate. Uh, I like that as just a, for general use for most people. I think that's a solid form. Maybe if you want to go a little bit cheaper and still get the benefits, you might look into like citrate, 
typically pretty well tolerated, usually a little bit cheaper. Uh, but yeah, glycinate's really solid. Next question, also, is it better to microdose melatonin and then take higher doses like three or five milligrams? <clears throat> With microdosing, I'm not sure, do you mean like frequent microdosing or just once a day or what? But there is, from my understanding, with most of the literature, if you look at everything as a whole, there was a good review I read of um, that had compiled everything together. And really, they had found not, not really any benefit with between about 500 micrograms, I think was what they said, up to 5 milligrams. And so these massive doses probably really aren't necessary. Um, is it going to hurt you? I, you know, I don't know that we know that necessarily. There might be some research on that, but no, I don't think it's um, necessary to dose it really high. You could probably, you can get away with, you know, 500 micrograms, maybe a milligram at most, depending on how frequently you're using it. And I think it's, I think too that it can be important to figure out if you actually need it. Yeah, you can get your melatonin levels checked if you get them checked at night or you can get them checked in the morning too. I mean, this is gonna, they're going to be different at different points during the day. Uh, something like a dried urinalysis like the Dutch test or the life extension version that shows those things. Um, do you need melatonin? That's a good question. You know, do you need it? Some people get nothing from it. They just don't need it because they have enough, you know, endogenous melatonin production so they just don't need exogenous uh supplementation so you know that's something you could ask yourself super cheap which is good um but yeah i mean there'd be reasons that some people might need it depending on like what they do at night light exposure stuff like that so i mean you try to figure out maybe hey do i need this or do i not need it next is Thoughts on central sleep apnea regarding remedies besides conventional treatment. Read, I uh, read that THC and CBD ease central sleep apnea, central apnea, and could be a good alternative. Okay, well, first, actually, it's funny you bring that up because I was just posted about sleep medications and some of their deleterious effects, like your uh, your REM sleep and your disturbances to your natural sleep cycle and your EEG and THC was, or just marijuana, I guess, was one of the things that got brought up in the thread of people's comments is how um, THC in and of itself could potentially negatively affect your sleep quality. And it's like a lot of things, a lot of the medications too, kind of the takeaway point was that a lot of things might ease your anxiety and help put you to sleep, it doesn't necessarily mean it's improving your quality, and a lot of them do not. They make the quality of sleep worse uh, by reducing the things that I mentioned, and they it's deceiving because you think, oh, I'm sleeping, so it's better. Well, I mean, if you're not sleeping at all, then sleeping some is still better, even if it's a poor quality, you know, obviously. But, um, yeah, a lot of these things do not actually enhance sleep quality. Uh, THC is it's kind of interesting because it can have some some SNS, so sympathetic nervous system activation, and some parasympathetic, some PNS activation. And so it's kind of tricky because it, it on paper, it's going to give most people poor quality sleep, even though it might help them sleep easier, if that makes sense, or fall asleep easier. So I think that's where they, it's like a false sense of it's helping. Um, CBD, on the other hand, does not have the stimulating effects at all. So it can help with sleep, certainly, for with the PNS activation. And there are, there's tons of research on that. Now I'm more and more popping up since it's pop, you know, it's becoming more popular. Now, <clears throat> you're, you're talking about sleep apnea, though, which is not really it's a little bit different sleep disorder i mean it's you stop breathing in your sleep i don't i could be way off base but i really don't think that either of these things or any most medications or over-the-counter supplementation is really going to help with sleep apnea um no i mean they're that's really not the purpose i mean you're stopping breathing that's not what these uh supplements do or medications do they don't deal with breathing and 
some things that can help. Yeah, there are some things, some things like wedges that you can lay on, um, different things that help keep your nasal passages open, you know, like that, that. And some things that, you know, help with snoring and stuff like that. Yeah, there are a lot of smaller alternatives. I don't think any of it really rivals like actually having a CPAP or an APAP machine, you know, an auto, auto pap. I, I mean, if you need it, you need it. That's probably going to be your best bet. So, okay. Last one. All right. Last question is with slowly increasing calories, what are your thoughts on bumping fats as opposed to tons of carbs? Uh, wanted to get your input maybe and where to put them. Currently I was doing 300 protein, 200, 250 to 300 carb and 70 ish fat a day on a training day and keeping all carbs peri workout. Uh, so around training after discussing, I'm now I'm moving toward bumping fats, 80 to 90 or more potentially possibly keeping carbs, 250 to 275 on regular training days. And I found if I push carbs above 400 and keep fats all about 70, I get so full through the day. That's the idea of bumping fats in lieu of carbs. Uh, in rest days, I'm trace carbs, 140 fat. Well, what's, what's better for a growth phase? Well, you really answered your own question. There's a digestion component there of being able to digest higher fats, maybe whether it's you just whether it's like a lipase issue or you don't have sufficient bile acids or whatever it is, you, if you can't digest them, and there are some supplements that'll help you digest fats, but let's exclude those from the equation. If you just don't digest them well, you might be someone that does better with carbohydrates or vice versa. If you digest them well, you might be someone that does better with the fats. Um, you also want to look at like insulin resistance. I mean, I have people that as inevitably, I'm not going to go far into this because it's a different topic, but inevitably you're going to have some insulin resistance build up as you add calories, the longer you're going to surplus, you know, yada, yada, yada. Now, what contributes to this more? Is it carbs or is it fat? That is person dependent. I see some people that get insulin resistant quick, eating tons of fat, some people that do it on tons of carbs, and some people that are good on like a combination of both, some people that need high carb trace fat or high fat lower carb it's all over the board normally it comes down to the digestion too there's normally a correlation normally the people that digest the fats very well are going to tolerate them in the whole insulin resistance realm too so there's normally a correlation not always but normally um there's not really a wrong way to do this like i said you kind of answered your own questions if you feel good and perform good on by adding more fats, yeah, you're gonna uh, you're gonna have the caloric surplus that you need to keep growing. Um, you have plenty of fat in there already for you know just basic hormonal function. I mean, that's fine. You don't have to add more. I mean, there's not going to be probably much regard in terms of hormones, um, but unless you have something like on your lipid panel you're trying to bump up cholesterol levels or something. But um, yeah, I mean, I don't see anything wrong with it necessarily. Again, I like to see that correlation between digestion and insulin resistance and performance. So those three things tend to go, kind of go hand in hand in hand. Um, whatever you feel good on, whatever keeps your, uh, you know, keeps your training performance up, whatever you can stave off insulin resistance the most with, because that'll give you a longer growth phase without getting fat, normally, and yeah, that's it. But no, I mean, you can, you can totally bump them up. That's fine. I have people that run decent mid range carbs, you know, 250, 300 that have 100, 150 plus grams of fat in there on off days. We normally separate them, not normally in the same meal, but it works out good for them. Other people, that's just no, no bueno. We don't want to do that. And uh, we'll go real high carb, low trace fat or vice versa. So Hope that helps, and that is it for today, guys. I will catch you all next week.